Hi everyone, I'm Tally, this is Farrell and we are bored of it and welcome to our buyer's guide for Root. Have you heard everyone talking about Root and you really want to know what the deal is? Maybe you really want Root but you've heard it's not very good for two players. Perhaps you already have Root and you're wondering which expansion to spring for. Well, we have got you covered. So, in this buyer's guide to Root, we're going to start by telling you what Root is, then how it plays, what you need to know before you buy it, and finally, what content is available. So we like to keep our buyer's guides factual, so we're going to just be covering the facts, but if you do want our opinions, that'll be the final section of the video. And if this was helpful in any way, please let us know and consider subscribing. Let's get to the root of the problem. Root, at its most base level, is a 2-4 player or 1-6 player with the right expansions. Asymmetrical war game, kind of hidden behind this veneer of cute woodland critters. It first appeared on Kickstarter in 2017, and it's designed by Cole Worley with art from Kyle Ferrin, published by Leather Games, and it got into backers' hands in 2018. It's been wildly popular ever since, uh, I believe it's on its sixth print run now, and I think at least the first three completely sold out, which I can attest to, because from when I decided I wanted to get Root, it took almost an entire year before there was a retail copy available. It's also been critically and just kind of publicly well received, people really like it, and it went almost straight away into the Board Game Geek Top 100 Games of All Time list, and it currently sits at position 25. Yep. Now, the game is set in the Great Woodland, with each player taking control of a faction in the fight for this area. The Marquis de Cat begin the game as the leaders of the woodland, and they're intent on harvesting the riches of the woodland and building infrastructure. The Eerie are the Old Guard, who used to be in charge, and they want to take back what they believe to be their birth-given right, but they're hampered by their very rigid code of conduct. The Woodland Alliance represent the downtrodden everyman, and they are sick of being dragged into others' wars, so they want to take back the woodland for themselves by using guerrilla tactics. The Vagabond is beholden to no one. They will play all sides of the conflict in order to further their own interests and complete mysterious quests. Ooh. Now, that is a tough question to answer, considering that every faction in Root plays asymmetrically, and at this point, there are a lot of factions. But they do have some common actions between them, like move and battle. The board is going to be a map of the woodland, and it's going to be divided into clearings and paths between the clearings. Now, you control a clearing if you have more warriors there than anyone else, and if you want to take a move action, you have to move to or from a clearing you control, and you can move as many warriors as you want while doing that. If you want to battle someone, then you pick the clearing, you pick a player in that clearing, and you roll two dice. The higher number goes to the attacker, the lower number to the defender, and the number on the dice is how many hits you will give out to each other. But you can't give out more hits than you have warriors in the clearing. Also, clearings have suits, fox, rabbit, and mouse. And these are represented also by the deck of cards that comes with the game, which have the same suits, plus one, the birds. And the birds are just a wild suit. And you're going to use cards to interact with specific matching clearings on the board, which is how some factions do their actions. Or you can craft the cards, allowing you to use the ability written on them, or perhaps giving you an item and some victory points. The game will immediately end when a player reaches 30 victory points, but as the factions are asymmetrical, how each player goes about scoring points is going to be completely different. The cats, they want to build buildings. They need to gather wood, and then they spend that wood to build buildings in clearings, and they score points for every building they build, with the more buildings they have of the same type, rewarding them with more points. The problem comes in that clearings have a limited number of building spaces between one and three, so they will likely eventually have to march out on the woodland to take more space so they can build more buildings. In a similar way, the Eerie wants to build roosts, 
uh, but they're limited by the fact that they can only have one roost per clearing. So again, they are going to need to march out and take over some territory. Where they differ is that although the cats are just given actions, so you get three actions, you can move, you can build, etc. The Eerie have a very strict decree. Every turn they have to add a card to their decree and then they move through their decree from left to right. And for every card, they have to do a matching action in a matching clearing. So while they can become powerful juggernauts, able to do more than any other player, if something goes wrong and they can't do even one of their actions, it all falls apart and they will lose victory points and all of those actions they've accumulated and have to start from the beginning. But they score at the end of every round based on how many routes they have out on the board. The Woodland Alliance spend cards in order to spread sympathy, which means other players have to provide them with cards if they want to move into a sympathetic clearing or remove them. Eventually, they can trigger a revolt, which means all enemy pieces are removed from a clearing and replaced by a rebel base and officers, which then makes it easier to spread more sympathy tokens, which is how the Woodland Alliance scores points. The Vagabond is all about items. They can give aid to other players by giving them cards, which firstly allows them to take items that the other players have crafted, and secondly, if they do it enough times, it will score them points. The Vagabond actually takes actions by using up their items, so the more items they have, the more they can do. The Vagabond can also score points by completing quests, which are essentially about exhausting specific items in matching clearings, and the more of a suit they complete, the more they'll score points. There are a few other ways to score points for all factions, namely crafting items and removing enemy buildings and tokens in a battle. Now, if you look at the box and the meeples, Root looks like a cute, lovely, inviting game, but that could not be further from the truth. It's an absolutely brutal war game, which is driven by player interaction, where you'll be actively hampering other players and often king-making. Winning will often require you to tactically impede other players from scoring points, as much as it's about you scoring your own points. There's definitely a gang up on the leader mentality at play here, which can frustrate some players. And even if you're not actively targeting anyone and you're just pursuing your own goals as neutrally as possible, you're still going to be getting in the way and forcing conflict. Next, it's a tough one to introduce to new players and it really requires repeated plays in order to shine. Because each player plays completely uniquely, it makes it a bit of a tough teach. It's also really important for each player to understand how they stop the other players from scoring points, which unfortunately is best learned by just playing as all of the different factions. So it's kind of a game that's designed for the same group to play over and over again. Now, what you should know is that due to the incredible asymmetry present in Root, not all factions are created equal. Data from across hundreds of games have shown that statistically, some factions have much higher win rates than others. Now, keep that in mind, but due to the way that Root plays and the amount of player interactivity involved in a game of Root, it's not something that should spoil your enjoyment. We've played over 30 games of Root, and it's not something that's ever bothered us. I don't think you'd particularly notice it, but just keep it in mind. And actually, my favorite factions players is the one that is statistically worse, but I just really like how they play and their vibe. It really doesn't affect the gameplay. Then, even though the box says it's for two to four players, really, it's only a three to four player game. In order to have a relatively balanced two-player game, the players will need to use the clearing occupying militant factions, which in the base game is just the Cats and the Eerie. If you only play games at two players, the base game of Root is definitely going to be a limiting experience for you and certainly won't capture the true wonder of Root. So, important to note, these might sound like negatives, but they're not supposed to be. This is just us telling you what you need to know so that you can have the best experience possible with Root. This game is the 25th best board game for a reason, and that reason is it is brilliant. We can't tell you how many games we've had where we'll just be mid-game and we'll look over each other and both say, this game is amazing. Or games where a player has won, but one or two other players were just one turn away from winning, 
despite playing as such wildly different factions. I think this is our second most played game, if we discount any party style games. What content is available free? Well, quite a lot, apparently. Base game, of course, but we've already covered that. Just gonna say here that the board is actually double-sided, so it comes with two maps, the fall map and the winter map. Then you have three faction expansions. You have the Rove Folk expansion, the Underworld expansion, and the Marauders expansion. Then there are two automated bot expansions, the Clockwork Expansions 1 and the Clockwork Expansion 2. After that, you have a bunch of kind of mini gameplay add-ons, such as the Vagabond pack, the Landmarks pack, the More Hirelings pack, the Rove Folk Hirelings pack, and lastly, a bunch of cosmetic stuff, such as resin marking clearings, you have special root card sleeves, you have play mats and plushies. Important to note that if you want to go up to six players, you just have to buy one of the faction expansions, each of which comes with two new factions. The Riverfolk expansion comes with two new factions, the Riverfolk and the Lizard Cultists, three new Vagabond types, a Vagabond player board, meaning that now you can have two Vagabonds in a single game of route, and finally, an automated bot player, Marquis the Cat player board. The Riverfolk are traders, and they can sell their cards and services to other players, and they score points by building trading posts all along the rivers in route, which is where other players can go to interact with them. The Lizard Cultists are obsessed with spreading the word of the Lizard God and building gardens, uh, and they do this in clearings they rule, and then they can discard a card which matches a suit of where they want to score the gardens. So if they discard a fox card, they score all of their fox gardens. And, you know, the more they have out, the more points they get, essentially. But what's interesting is that if their warriors are killed, they actually come back as acolytes, which allows the lizard cultists to do more actions. The Underworld expansion comes with two new factions, the Underground Duchy and the Corvid Conspiracy, as well as two new maps, the Mountain Map and the Lake Map. The Underground Duchy, they're going to be popping up all over the woodland, which is easy for them because they're moles, so they dig tunnels, pop. And what they want to do is they want to sway ministers back home in the borough to their cause of controlling the woodland. And they do this by being in a lot of different clearings and then revealing cards matching the clearings that they're in. And then they can sway a minister, which will score them some points. And then the minister gives them an action to use throughout the rest of the game. The Corvid Conspiracy, they're sneaky little fellas because they're gonna also kind of pop up all around the board but they're going to litter it with criminal plot tokens. And what they want to do is flip these criminal plot tokens. And they want to do this for two reasons. The first being that when they flip it, there will be some sort of effect, such as blowing up everything in a clearing. And the other is that whenever they flip a plot token, they score for all of the plot tokens that they have already face up on the board. When you get to the maps, the mountain map, this has a big tower in the central clearing, and if you control that clearing at the end of your turn, you'll get a victory point. Plus, there are a lot of paths that you can excavate by spending a card from your hand in return for one VP and kind of creating a new route between clearings. The lake map is based around a big old lake, and there's a ferry on it that when you do a move action, you can take, and you can move that ferry to any of the other clearings that touch on the lake. The Marauders expansion comes with two new factions, the Keepers in Iron and the Lord of the Hundreds, as well as four hirelings representing the factions found in base route. The Finders in Iron are all about recovering relics from the woods of the woodland, but firstly they need to set up camp in adjacent clearings. They take actions via their retinue, which is similar to the Eries Decree. However, if they don't meet certain conditions, Finding and recovering the relics will cause them to lose cards from their retinue, thereby reducing the actions available to them. The Lord of the Hundreds is all about combat and subjugation, as they score points from ruling clearings that only has their pieces in. However, the Lord is a kleptomaniac, 
and is obsessed with collecting the treasures of the woodland. So it's important to collect new items so that the Lord can take more actions. The hirelings are a new addition to gameplay and are often representing the factions found in Baseru and its expansions. Play with three in a game and the first player to reach four, eight or 12 victory points gets to take control of a hireling, giving you new ways to interrupt with the game based on how that faction plays. However, you can't keep them for very long and after a few turns, you'll have to pass them down to another player. Firstly, the hirelings are great at making the board more busy in a two-player game and generally making two-player games more robust. Secondly, they entice players to race for victory points early on in the game, which can make for some interesting games. Thirdly, they're a great attempt at a catch-up mechanism, as typically players who are not in first place get to control them for longer and players who are in first place are more likely to pass them down to players in last place. The Clockwork Expansions 1 and 2 each automate four root factions from the root universe, with Clockwork Expansion 1 automating the factions from the base game, and the Clockwork Expansion 2 automating the factions from the Riverfolk expansion and the Underworld expansion. What these come with is player boards for these automated factions that kind of tell you how to run through them and some cards which will help you alter the difficulty or add traits to the bots to change up how they play every time you play with them. What these are good for is if you want to play root solo or if you are playing at lower player counts and you just want to kind of fill out the game and make it more chaotic and root like. They're also particularly great if say you mainly play as a couple because Adding in these factions will allow you to then play as factions which you wouldn't usually be recommended to play as for gameplay pounce in a two-player game, as you can have the bots be the big militaristic heavy factions and then you can be the little vagabond or whatever. It's important to note though that if you get Clockwork Expansion 2, none of the faction pieces come with this box, so you'd actually need to own these two expansions first to be able to actually play the bots and automate them. The Exiles and Partisans pack comes with a whole new deck of cards, which can be used instead of the deck that comes with the base game and contains different craftable actions and shakes up the gameplay. The Vagabond pack comes with all new Vagabond types, each with their own unique meeple and special power. The Riverfolk Hirelings pack and the More Hirelings pack provides both hirelings that match the factions from the base game, but also completely unique ones from the Root universe. The Landmark Pack adds four new landmarks, which aim to shake up the woodland in various ways, much like the tower and the ferry did for the maps from the Underworld expansion. So, as we said, this is really gonna be the only part of the video where we share our opinions about Root. Bottom line is, we love Root. It is very nearly our most played game, in part due to the endless replayability from the different factions. And of course, we have all of the wonderful new content that's just been released. So that's going to take the replayability to infinite levels. We 100% fully recommend Root. That said, it is important for you to go back and watch the what you need to know about Root section of this video to understand if what Root is at its core is really for you, because it's certainly not going to be for everyone. You should get Root if you're going to be able to play it repeatedly because that's when it really shines and you'll have some wonderfully tense and interactive games. We do have a full review about Root if you want to know our opinions a little bit more, although it's a bit of an older video, so it doesn't include some of the newer content. And of course, we'd welcome anyone to ask us any questions in the comments. Yeah. So Root is just such a quality product on the whole. There really isn't any of this content we wouldn't recommend. You know, all of the factions that come with the expansions are excellent. There isn't any we don't enjoy playing. All of the mini expansions really shake up the gameplay in ways that we like. But if you were going to push us, we would say that try the uh, Underworld expansion or the Marauders expansion first as your first kind of big box faction expansion. This is just because both of them come with factions that we really like and they come with nice little gameplay elements that shake things up, such as a double-sided map with landmarks in the Underworld or hirelings in the Marauders. And obviously, before you go all in on everything, play base root first, because it's not gonna be for everyone. But the flip side of why to get those two and not Riverfolk 
was that Rogue Folk's probably the weakest expansion. Uh, still enjoy the factions, but the Lizards are kind of statistically the weakest and have the lowest win rate. And the River Folk are very table and faction dependent. If you're playing with the wrong factions or your table doesn't quite get that table talk going and you can't quite sell your goods to the other players or they don't really understand the benefits of it, then you're going to really struggle to play as that faction and you can just be shut out and have a bad time. And on top of that, some of the gameplay extras it comes with, like automated cats, like those have already been outstripped by 2.0 cats, automated cats, in the Clockwork expansion. So when it comes to the mini expansions, none of them are strictly necessary because what they give you, you kind of get tasters of in the big box expansions. You know, more Vagabonds, Hirelings, and Landmarks. But if you love Root, then you should definitely get them because they're great just to add in and shake things up even more. Coming on to the Clockwork expansions, if you're mainly going to play Root solo or two player, these are almost a must buy, but they are extremely well done. They're some of the best automated opponents we've seen, if not the best, and they're very challenging to play against. They're as annoying as having another player in the game, <laughs> and importantly, they're very easy to run generally. Now, you probably don't need both because they both do the same thing. It's just more down to what factions you want to play against. And generally, everything root related, I believe, is extremely well priced, uh, particularly for what you get. But the price of the Clockwork expansions does rub me up the wrong way, considering that they're both $40. And all you get is four faction mats you get some cards and a couple of punch board tokens. And for that same price, you could get the River Folk expansion with all the stuff that comes in that. Now, you can also actually print and play and letter games are pretty good at doing that. So you can probably find the files and just download them and run it yourself if that's something you want to do. Yep. And as a side note, there's also a digital version of Root available to play which is going to be by far the best way to learn how the different factions work, if it's going to be down to you to teach a table full of people how to play. It's also a really fantastic digital implementation. And that was our buyer's guide for Root. If you enjoyed this video, we'd really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you're not already. And please, please feel free to ask us any questions about Root down in the comments. We'd be more than happy to answer so that we can talk about Root some root, more. Root, 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 <laughs> Root. See ya. Bye. Bye.